Hello all and welcome to this Sunday afternoon session at this year's Arise Festival, uh, Festival of Left Ideas. Today our session title, organised in conjunction with the All Grieve Truth and Justice campaign, is celebrating solidarity, the crucial role of art and music in the minor strike. We'll soon be commemorating the events at All Grieve, which took place on the 18th of June 1984, which means we're a year away now from the 40th anniversary of that terrible event. The minor strike is a pivotal moment in the history of British politics and industrial relations. But it's not just history. It also laid the neoliberal foundations for the crisis we're currently living through. And it has left an indelible mark on the culture of the UK and our shared cultural memory, leading to the creation of art, music, theatre, dance, poetry and a host of popular cultural touchstones. We're here today to talk about the ongoing legacy and the relationship between culture, class struggle and solidarity. Um, before I introduce our panel though, I'd also like to make three quick requests. Firstly, please, you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see someone post a donate link in the chat. This is a festival that's run by volunteers. We can only get by on your donations uh, and it really, really does help um, us to facilitate this, these kind of events. Um, secondly, I'd ask you to check out the rest of the festival programme. Um, there's a huge array of events that are going on. They happen every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Sunday. So check out the link tree. Again, someone should post the link in the chat. And thirdly, Please, please, I don't know if I mentioned this, donate. <laughs> we really need your help and financial assistance. This is how we work as an organisation. Um, okay, so today we're joined by uh, a great panel. Uh, I'll just introduce them quickly. Kate Flannery and Chris Peace of the All Grief Truth and Justice campaign, the campaign that's fighting for justice for the miners who were beaten and fitted up by the authorities at the All Grief coking plant during the 84-85 miners' strike. Mike Jackson of Lesbians and Gays Support the Miners, the group depicted famously in the film Fried, and Gary Clark, the artistic director of the eponymous theatre and dance company behind the show Coal and Wasteland, which is currently touring. So let's get the ball rolling with our first question. Um, like I said, the 84-85 strike is, isn't just a pivotal moment in British politics, but it's also a touchstone of our culture too. Um, what do you all think, and perhaps we could start with uh, the, um, with Kate and Chris from the Orgreave campaign to get the ball rolling, um, is the extent of the influence of the strike on culture and why do you think it's had that influence? Uh, Kate, Chris, if you want to get started. Uh, I'll kick off and say yeah, thanks for the, the invite and it's great to come to a, a meeting with activists which actually starts with the word celebrating. <laughs> Um, it's a struggle out there and it's important that we we consider you know in that struggle we do use many different tools and definitely music art theatre dance something that can reach an audience that we don't necessarily expect to reach by writing pamphlets articles and speaking at meetings um but yeah i mean every key moment um, and I've, I've come on to the minor strike, but very, very briefly, if you think about key moments in history and being a folk musician yourself, Sam, you know how much stuff is written about and telling the story of the class struggle. Uh, and I always think that, you know, the, the shining example to me uh, was uh, 19, 19, sorry, 1968 uh, and the subsequent years where we actually saw music uh, which was protest music coming into the mainstream. We saw art, uh, which could be quickly reproduced. I've got a huge painting of uh, La Beauté et Don La Rue from that. Um, and so, yes, pivotal moments uh, are not just there to change politics, um, but they're there to also uh, bring culture um, together into that as well. Um, so I'll just start with that opening uh, uh, comment. Yes, going back to 68, I mean, I'm a child of the 60s, uh, but my parents were political activists and I remember a lot of the songs and that are still being sang now from the peace movement, particularly, um, and, uh, you know, the Vietnam War. And so, and I remember my parents having uh, a little red song book. And uh, <laughs> so lot, lots of events and activities that we went to were actually really quite enjoyable. I mean, they, you know, as a child, I didn't really realise what was going on, but I knew that when we were going to things, there was a lot of marching around the streets, but there was always fun. We used to have fun singing on the coaches going down to London uh, and singing some of the sort of revolutionary songs. So there's, there's that tradition that obviously goes way before the minor strike, 
that thankfully carried on during the minor strike and it, and they were our songs you know it wasn't it wasn't necessarily songs that uh, somebody else had written for us they were songs that sort of came out of working class struggle that were written by working class people and performed by working class people and and that's the pleasure and privilege of it all really to uh, be involved in in things and to um to be a part of it and be a part of that creativity yeah um I'm just thinking like in response to that like um, Mike and Gary in terms of the um like the resonance of the minor strike in particular like Mike you're involved in Pride while well, depicted in the film Pride and obviously Gary like your, your your output is um deals with this particular issue why do you think that the minor strike has such a resonance in culture today and and kind of and and continues to sort of affect not only the political landscape in the way that I described in the intro, but you know the cultural one too. Should I kick? I'll, I'll kick off with that one if that's all right, Gary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, the miners' strike was the biggest industrial dispute since the general strike. I mean, it it, it, it it's such an important part of British history. Uh, Thatcher came along and basically started to dismantle democracy. That's what she was all about, really. I, I, I think we, the gloves need to come off you now with people like Thatcher. That's that's exactly what she did. Uh, GLC opposed her. What did she do? She abolished the GLC. Uh, you know, uh, queer supported the miners. What did she do? She brought in Section 28. Yeah, that, that's the monster that she, she was. Um, and it, on a scale... Of struggle so huge as as that were millions of people get involved and then that's when the artists become really important to us because you know it's the same struggle forever you know it's the poor versus the rich and we haven't got the poor there's lots of us but what we haven't got is money um and and so we make our own art uh because the other art is made by them the ruling <laughs> And it's bourgeois, and uh, it's not something that we can particularly relate to. And um, I just love the kind of ingenuity of working class people. When when the chips are down and the, and there's a struggle on, people just discover that they've got talents and abilities that previously they were unaware of, and out of necessity, they're forced to kind of expose those talent so in in the miners' strike, kind of women were were called to speak at public meetings often and they'd never done that kind of thing before but the men couldn't do it because they were either kind of on a picket line or uh, uh, temporarily put in police cells or whatever um so that you know it's that talent suddenly comes to the fore and, and it's absolutely brilliant um i mean one of the things that lgsm did is, is we made mark ashton who who uh, was really the founder of lgsm uh, he made this homemade banner uh, and it, on the front, it just said lesbians and gay support the miners. But on the back of it, he'd drawn a, a picture, and it's a big banner. Uh, he'd drawn a picture of Margaret Thatcher and a, a, a picture of a big fat policeman. Uh, and in between those two uh, headshots uh, was the first verse from Solidarity Forever. Absolutely brilliant. I've never seen a banner like that since, because it meant that every every march we ever went on, we had our song to sing because the words you couldn't fail you know the words were on the back of the banner so there we were singing along to it and that solidarity forever became our kind of signature song um and i really love the miners uh strike the old kind of miners anthems uh there's a lovely one called a miners life is like a sailor's um you know some of these songs going right back to the 19th century um, and uh, I mean that's kind of old stuff and more modern stuff. Of course, we we had the, the we had the pits and perverts uh, benefit gig at, at the Electric Ballroom in Camden, headed up by um, Bronski Beat. So there we have a kind of modern day uh, people kind of speaking out for the struggle. Uh, and Gary, you're coming. You're you were but you <laughs> you were a very young child during the miners' strike, but. Uh, tell us about what, wh why you support, where you come from, and and why you supported them, and how you got into the wonderful art that you produce. Well, it's interesting because Sam, when you're, when you're introdu introducing um, 
you know, this this webinar, I got really emotional when I hear those words, you know, like it's, four, it's a 40th anniversary of the strike and of all grief. It's like suddenly the swell of emotion and pride and anger and feeling just comes right up to the surface. It's not gone anywhere. It's really here. I still carry it in my chest and in my heart and in my blood. Um, you know, and I'm and I'm from Grimethorpe, you know, which was at the real centre of some of these big disputes that were happening. I was a young boy. I was only four during the strike, but I've got vivid, vivid memories of the village around that time. And I also remember the village changing as well after the strike. So, you know, Grimethorpe was this very, very vibrant, colourful village, surprisingly, being a mining village. But we, we had a lot of art and creativity around that time. There were the miners' galas, the majorettes. We had all of the, the floats coming down, the fancy dress. The miners obviously used to play in the bands. You know, music was a big part of Grimethorpe. A lot of the miners used to do lots of different um, sporting activities as well after working underground. So it was a release. So art and culture and colour and song and music, it was a big part of Grimethorpe and a big part of that community. And then I saw firsthand at what happened to all of that vibrancy following the strike. And I was a teenager around that time. And it's at that time that I discovered art and creativity as a coping mechanism and a way of dealing with this very compounded environment that we were living through under, under Thatcher. And, you know, the village was being torn apart in many, many different ways. And I found my path through creativity through that. It wasn't through privilege. It was through a necessity and need. And I think I've carried that through my career and as I started to work in the industry, I realized that what was missing was working class storytelling and no one was talking about what happened. I felt very alone somehow in this very kind of middle class art sector that I was working in. And I wanted to fill that gap and I wanted to be a vessel for communication. Um, and I set off, that was my mission, is, is to, to create um, working class contemporary dance work that tells these really powerful stories of working class British history and culture that I think people need to know about. And we know that people want us to forget about that time. And I think people like us are, are saying, no, we've got to remember where we've come from. We've got to remember what has shaped our communities and our society and, you know, hold the people accountable. But also, like Chris was saying, to celebrate, to actually be proud that we're, you know, we're standing up for our communities and our people. And, you know, a massive heritage came from the, um, you know, and, and tradition and history comes from the coal mining communities. And I want to celebrate that through the work that we do. Um, and wherever there's politics, there's art, <laughs> historically, especially in the 80s. I, I've got... I've, some points to talk later about that, but I'm interested in around how politics can, uh, you know, can really push people under pressure to revolt back through many different mediums, whether it be fashion, music, um, art, creativity, poetry. You know, sometimes we get the best art when when we've got to really push back against politics. Mm -hmm. I guess that's where I stand in a lot of the work that I create. Yeah, I think that's a really important point because I like, often, as you know, people think of like art, art coming from like elite institutions and it's like London. I think the point you make about like growing up in in Grimethorpe and, you know, in the north, in uh, a, a mining village, actually, you know, those places have culture too. And, um, you know, and it's so important that we celebrate that. And, you know, we don't just think that culture is attached to elite institutions. That's a really interesting point for me as a folk musician. Um, and that idea that, you know, you can have art and culture that comes from a bottom up community based place. Um, and I think uh, you mentioned the, the the Miners Gala and all the banners and the brass bands that you see at that. It's a really like concrete artistic expression of the solidarity that binds communities together and how mm -hmm. it doesn't come from outside the community. It's produced by workers as they're struggling for their rights. Um, so I guess it's a kind of open question to all of you, really. What role do you think? that art, music and drama played during the strike and afterwards in terms of actually building solidarity, you know, building those community bonds that strengthen mm -hmm. communities and allow them to, to fight back. And how important are art, music, drama, other forms of culture um, in doing that, do you think? Uh, shall we go, uh, Kate, shall we bring you in? I think people, um, some people, uh, and possibly even a lot of people underestimate 
the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that were actually involved um, during the miners' strike and, and the thousands upon thousands that were involved in supporting that strike. And um, the creativity that was happening all over Britain and in various parts of the world as well to show support. Um, so I think, first of all, there were lots of people doing lots of things, but the creativity that that continued throughout the strike were the things like the banners, and that's been uh, referenced uh, through Gary talking about the galas, because I used to go to the local galas in the that sort of Sheffield area around Wakefield and Rother, um, Rother and Barnsley, uh, the Yorkshire Miners Galas. And um, it was really exciting seeing all these banners going down the road and, and you couldn't not cry, especially when the bass bands kicked off, you know, so the music, but, and this is all created by, by working class people, all that artwork, all that tradition of the banners that was going on, as Gary said, in very vibrant um, communities with people who had security, the security of work, you know, people had to had money and pride you know they were colorful bright places so these wonderful banners going down going down the streets and this celebration and then there was the big events at the end and you know they were community events but they were highly political events as well um and people brought along different different cultures and different music so there wasn't just the brass bands you know i, I remember people coming over from cuba and playing music at, at one of the festivals that I went to locally. Um, and all this carried on during the minor strike. So it was a really great opportunity for people to triumph over adversity, to get some pleasure and enjoyment out of the togetherness of creating all this, having fun together, you know, at really hard times, you know, and we have to do that to keep going. And it's one of the reasons why we were keen to do this session today, because it gives us an opportunity to be positive about our political activism, really. I think as well, it was the, the, the huge variety as well. So like Kate says, and, and I mean, and, you know, playing a brass instrument is, is such a skill, you know, and to actually it's kind of, you know, the fact that that was taught in the villages and it was passed down and people were passed instruments around. So there was this high level of musicianship as well uh, within these, these people who were on the cutting edge uh, of fighting uh, the attacks on uh, the deindustrialization that was happening. So there's that side of it. Um, but the variety of other musicians and the kind of music that you had, and it was everything, um, you know, to, I mean, I, I, I love 80s music. I love all kinds of music, but I do love 80s. And I think, you know, sometimes if you look at 80s music, some of it was there to be shouty and angry and commentating on what was happening. Some of it was complete escapism as well, uh, but both were actually political responses. Some was more direct. So I've got a poster um, of, um, uh, the found, foundation of the nation, uh, fuel foundation of the nation from uh, the test department, which I know some people will remember. Um, but they took their music and they they pushed boundaries within the music that they produced as well because they used the industrial sounds of mining. Um, the you know the industrial clash of tools was was made into music. Um, and, you know, and this was very, very powerful. And um, if anybody's got that particular one where they brought in a Welsh male voice choir from a mining village as well. Um, I mean, I recently saw them a few years back now, but they did um, the films that they projected as part of that. They did it as an installation on Dunstan Stays up in Newcastle. So it was a whole kind of evening and a whole event. Um, but the music and the images coming together on Dunstan Stays, which is basically derelict now, and yet, you know, there used to be, you know, millions of tonnes of coal shipped out of there uh, as part of our international uh, trade. Uh, so you've got things like this, and then you've got the commentary of bands, you know, who were getting into the charts as well. Uh, some, of, some of the early Wham stuff, was very political, was commentating on working class difficulties. Um, and people probably didn't realise it. It wasn't kind of Brett's hammer smashing the mirror, you know. But <laughs> it, 
it, it was there and it, it was creeping in mainstream. And of course, you know, the Flying Pickets, uh, you know, had a number one hit around that time as well. Uh, I can't remember if it was 83 or 84, but, you know, it's uh, the, the huge variety. And of course, many of these artists, either openly or secretly, as we find out afterwards, were donating huge amounts of money from the work that they did as well, straight into uh, the, the, the miners' funds. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Of course, we all know that uh, Comrade George from Wham was a great comrade. Like. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah. Mike, was that um, a similar sort of experience for you in terms of, obviously you've mentioned uh, the Pits and Perverts gig. Like, what did that do in terms of kind of galvanizing support for the miners like outside of those communities like in london um like away from uh wales and from the north of england yeah um i mean it, it was a tremendous night that uh i mean bronski beat were, were up there in the charts anyway so what one one isn't you know you can't say how many people were coming to support the miners and how many people didn't care about the miners were just going to see Bronski be uh, but uh, none of us cared about that because in uh, you know, the ones who were really primarily coming to listen to the music and see Bronski be would be influenced by uh, the speeches so uh, for example there's a you can, you, in, in our uh, video that we made, Dan All Out Dancing in Delice, which you can find on YouTube, there is a very, very uh, poor but audible segment where Di Donovan is actually speaking to the crowd. Um, and it's a really good little speech that he, uh, that he makes there. Um, and it was very moving. So, you know, th there you've got an instance of people hopefully becoming politicised, becoming conscious, because of the, the medium of, of 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 the art so that's another tool in a sense that that, that we that, that we use with art is 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 actually increases consciousness amongst amongst people um and uh, one of my favorite uh quotes when i first heard it i thought yeah that's me uh it was uh i think it was emma goldman stop me if uh, if i've got this wrong but she she famously said if i can't dance I don't want to be part of your revolution. Um, and I heard that when I was in my early 20s and I just went, right on, sister. <laughs> <laughs> because there is a kind of betrayal of, 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 of socialism and, and the left about us all being like a bit of hair shirts and <laughs> we want poverty. We don't want poverty. We want the opposite of poverty. We want joy and happiness. That's what we strive for, to be universally available to everybody, not just the elite few. Um, and, you know, we have the revolution in order to get to such a joyous, uh, joyous place. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, the, the great one is that. Um <laughs> But I mean, you look back, and and you know, there were the Pittman poets up in uh, in the northeast. Uh, they were in the kind of nineteen thirties, I think. Uh, you had the painting school as well up in the northeast, uh, uh, earlier still. Um, and and great folk singers like Woody Guthrie and you and McCall. Um, yeah, yeah, and and of course we, we supported the South Wales miners and the very community that we support is there was the Ontloin silver band it was what wasn't a brass band it was a silver band in in their case and you know I I you know these are really difficult times we're going through now uh, and I struggle to 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 keep uh, optimistic about things really and it, it is actually art in all its various forms that's keeping me going at the moment yeah. you know it ain't it ain't the news that I'm hearing. Uh, in fact, I, I tend not to listen to the news now because it it it, it you know, it's just so biased. It's just appalling. Um, so I'm reaching for art, and I don't need to listen to the news because actually the news has been the same for for fifty years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's about housing, about national service, about education, blah blah blah. It's, it's always been the same. Um, and so what keeps me kind of fresh and perky and, and, and so on is music, poetry, uh, and in more recent times, uh, Gary really kind of inspired me when I first saw uh, 
Cole, his first production in the trilogy, uh, just before, well, about two years before COVID, uh, that's the first time I'd seen contemporary dance. And uh, I was absolutely knocked out by it. I'd never seen anything like it. It was so in, really powerful and moving. Um, you know, it, 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 it blew my mind away, really. And, and even more so, his uh, sequel to that, Wasteland, which I only saw a couple of weeks ago in, in Birmingham. I mean, it starts with, uh, perhaps Gary can, I should leave it to Gary to t t tell us more about it, it, but it starts just with music. There's nothing that happening on stage and that music is just so compelling so dominating and dark uh, it gets your heart going and, and nothing's happened <laughs> it's a dark stage you know and then it, it, you know what's you can it's foreboding you know what's coming uh so over to you on that one gary <laughs> oh thank you Matt. that was a nice segue in um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess, well, first of all, as everyone's kind of speaking, I was kind of going, actually, underneath all of this is idea that art is a form of communication. And I think what political art is good at is being a form of communication. Uh, but I think it's explicitly so in what we do. So I just kind of want to just lay that down for comment later on. Um, and I think we all want to communicate something through what we do. There's deep kind of messages and... Um, a deep sense of pride behind our art. And I think that's why sometimes a lot of the art um, that I've driven through the minor strike or through working class culture is kind of explicit or we, you know, we kind of, we stand by it. Um, there's a kind of boldness to it. And that's definitely something that I've kind of taken through into my live performance work, which predominantly uses dance to tell the story. Um, the, the human body is an amazing vessel for communication and expression and emotion. And if you look at the mining industry, that's also full of those three things, physicality, um, you know, passion, emotion. The body's a fantastic tool um, to tell these kind of stories. So when I first started to make coal, the parallels between men working underground and, and dance and movement um, were very, very close. Mm -hmm. And I could really see movement being driven through the, through this very kind of deep physicality that the men used to do, but also similar to what the women used to do as well. I mean, you know, and then looking at the strike and also the protest, which again was very physical. Everything had a kind of physical presence to it. And that's what I was attracted to. But not only that, just hearing people, you know, Mike, Chris, Kate, you've all mentioned these uh, these people that were around at the time, you know, Testy Parliament, people making music, the brass bands. Through my production, what I try to do is bring all those elements together to tell the story. So with Cole, we connected with 18 championship uh, colliery bands all around the country. Um, we worked with over 100 women from coal mining communities who'd never been really been on stage before to come and perform with the professional company and tell their stories. We collaborated with the Women Against Pit Closures, Anne Scargill and Betty Cook, telling us we had to sing the song. So we put in the song. We worked with the NUM and, and were able to create this amazing film of all the miners' banners, which then became a backdrop. Um, we were able to get hold of some amazing archive footage of the of of all grief and of the of, of the strike, which we worked with a filmmaker to pull together as a kind of montage. So everything that we're talking about, I guess, lives through the work that we deliver as a as a company. It's not just about dance. It's about all these different elements woven together um, to build a kind of body of truth, I think, and a, and a body of representation for the working class. Um, and as Mike said, you know, Wasteland, the sequel also carries those elements. It's about really trying to get to the truth of of what the work is. And in particular, what Mike's talking about in that first scene of Wasteland is we just hear the sound of the underground. Mm. I uh, I worked with an amazing sound designer who went down uh, at the National Coal Mining Museum and was able to capture the sounds and he created this amazing soundscape. And the first kind of five minutes of Wasteland is in complete darkness with this, with this sound. Um, and I remember Mike saying, straight away that emotion that feeling is still there and it just resonated with him not just Mike but many other people that come and see the performance it kind of just triggers something in them straight away people go back and remember those sounds and smells and feelings and I think that's what live theatre is amazing at is recapturing these pivotal points in history and I'm really proud of what we're doing with our mm. work you know it's really awesome. um, 
it's really pushing through and, and we're getting new audiences people that like mike said never might have seen contemporary dance before are coming for either the solidarity the story the history but suddenly they're seeing it retold in a different art form absolutely um that's kind of uh i'm gonna sort of segue into a kind of question about um you know use the, a really interesting phrase about talking about telling the truth about events like and using art to tell the truth about events uh, which i think is kind of really interesting because um a, like i was born in 1987 so i i didn't you know i didn't directly um like i didn't directly engage with what was going on at the time i wasn't born um and actually my understanding of the strike is totally mediated by uh friends uh like people on this call uh my parents you know part of that sort of like family family memory but also the stuff i've seen on telly you know films like pride films like brushed off you know those sorts of things and uh yeah and actually i don't know even like uh uh, Chris and Kay and I were involved in organising an event together on Peaceloo and Orgreave and going, you know, to Barnsley to look at all the, the, the banners and like seeing the Court and Wood banner and stuff like that, which is absolutely like amazing. So I, I guess my question is, um, and also actually for many people at the time too, you know, even, you know, if you're watching the news uh, on telly at the time of Orgreave, you would have seen the BBC run film footage backwards to portray or try and falsely implicate picketers in starting the violence or grief. Um, so I guess my question is, how do you think film has sort of subsequently informed and drama and all that, in fact, has subsequently informed how people under like people like me, how people understand the sort of political uh, the political situation of the strike? And to use your phrase again, how how do you think it's helped to kind of tell the truth about what happened when there were so many lies flying about at the time? I, th I think, yeah, absolutely, Sam. And I think the extent of the lies just can't be underestimated because it was mainstream and it was everywhere. There was the false narrative being told coming out of the tally on the fronts of papers. Um, it was absolutely everywhere. Whenever you saw any footage that had been taken, you've got to bear in mind this was taken from police behind police lines so what you saw on the bbc um was from police lines so it's you know it literally only had one angle literally it only had the one angle uh, and we know about the famous um you know reversing of the footage uh, that happened um which you know the bbc eventually did acknowledge and uh, and apologize for uh, although they didn't make uh, what i would call a full and frank admission about it uh, it, was, it was an accident, didn't sorry. it? <laughs> so, yeah, that was it. And I think one of the things that I remember as a 14-year-old during the strike um, was some of the static um, propaganda. So, you know, on the news, there would be a static graphic with the numbers. I mean, it's quite Orwellian, really, just numbers. It'll say something like, four miners return to work. And yeah. that would be the headline. But with this very, very clear graphic above it, you know, this is, so, you know, telling people that that's the news. So the extent of the lies, you know, there was a huge tanker to be turned uh, in getting the truth out. And I think, you know, we are constantly telling people to tell the truth about what happened or grief to, to make sure people who aren't familiar about, you know, not just that day, but the whole state ordered violence that happened. Um, you know, that is the great story kind of like that has to be there. Uh, but it's much easier to reach a lot of people quickly when you put them in something that, you know, tells the truth, is entertaining, maybe has a little bit of, you know, poetic license, um, but it does, you know, get a message across. And I know we've mentioned pride before, and it probably might will want to come in here. Uh, because, you know, not 100% based on facts, but it had the very essence, which I think people got from that. If if, you, if I can think of one word that sums up that people walk out understanding, having watched it, it's the word solidarity. It really does bring that together. Um, so I think that's happened. There's been other other kind of like feature films that, you know, we've, we've seen, we've mentioned, um, Brassed Off. 
Um, we've got a lot of the kind of um, commentary that's coming through kind of the little screen dramas now as well. Um, so, you know, there was recently Sherwood, uh, which is a whole, that's a whole episode of Arise on its own. Uh, because whilst uh, there were many um, uh, fair and just criticism, criticisms that could be made of that, I think it did actually reach an audience um, to try to tell some of the stories uh, of what it was like in, in, in you know, in, in a village like that during the strike. So I think it is getting through, but I think we've got a huge, huge mountain to climb, uh, you know, to climb to, to be able to get uh, the truth uh, properly acknowledged. Um, I mean, for for the for the younger people watching who who weren't even born in the the miners' strike, a, a, a documentary that I strongly recommend. It's a brilliant documentary. It's, uh, still the enemy within, um, and what makes it such a good documentary is everybody who was involved in it, a producer, the writer, and and everything. They were all too young to remember the miners' strike, and that's why they made the documentary because they they wanted to have a very discursive look at the strike from beginning to end so literally that's how it starts it starts before the strike shows you everything leading up to the strike it goes in detail all the way through the strike the outcome sadly yeah and then where it could leave you in a quite a forlorn uh, place it brings you right up to kind of modern day times and and current day struggles to show that we you know we still are fighting and and and, and it all still exists the, the mechanism for, for for keeping up the fight um i think gary mentioned earlier on in in this session that um a, a lot of the right wing uh, you know they love to say oh it's all in the past that so you don't want to be staying yes. all that stuff well <clears throat> sorry darling there's unfinished business <laughs> and, and we will never forget that. And it absolutely, to, to the, until we actually get what we want, um, then there is unfinished business. And, and what we want amongst other things is justice. Um, and the Augury Truth and Justice campaign is, is just one uh, facet of that, that justice, but it's an important one. Uh, because the state, the Tories, the government have always uh, denied uh, that they did any wrong. And if that was the case, then why on earth wouldn't they accept the um, call for a public inquiry into what happened at Orgreave? Well, it, it's, it's, it's quite obvious why they won't uh, allow it, is because the truth will come out. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think uh, Chris mentioned that... Um, the BBC did eventually apologise for, for the footage of the Battle of Orgreave to, for making it look like it was the miners who were uh, provoking the violence there, and it, it wasn't, and they, they finally accepted that. But the people who made Still the Enemy Within bought footage from the BBC to include in that documentary and were explicitly told by the BBC that they must not mention... Um, that public apology, yeah, they weren't allowed to do it, but I can because I had to do it in that document. So put that out there. I mean, how 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 disgusting is that? So the BBC charged them a fortune, uh, but for using that footage and then put that caveat on it. Really, they don't have any soul at the BBC. Can I can I just? Uh try it back a bit because I, I i'd like to i know i know we're talking uh, about this a lot but i'd like to talk about pride again because pride brought a load of people together who'd either not seen each other for years or had seen each other for the first time and um because we were active in the old grief truth and justice campaign and i was also active in a community project called the friends of edward carpenter we um we took advantage of the LGBTQ plus history month and did a screening of Pride in its early days and brought together the All Grief Truth and Justice campaign, um, the Friends of Edward Carpenter and Lesbian and Gay Support the Miners, and did loads of fantastic events together. We screened the film, we did Q and A's, we did artistic events with with uh, local artists. 
And uh, it, that really did engage a whole new crowd of people who were either of a, a much younger generation or even of an older generation who'd forgotten a lot of the activity around the minor strike, around Section 28, around uh, campaign for LGBTQ rights in this, in this country. So it just brought us all together. And, and ever since we've been having great times together. So that film sort of engaged us all with some really wonderful political activity and loads of fun. Um, mm. And we're still screening it now. And Chris and I are speaking at a screening of it next week. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. I think as well, it always, whenever we are, uh, and it does happen a lot, we're in shared spaces together because we're wanting uh, to march and rally. And uh, we're always kind of with our all group banners, of which we have many. And we must talk <laughs> about some of the designs within our own campaign as well and how we've, you know, put that at the forefront of our activism as well. Uh, but it's always like, where's LGSM? We want to march with LGSM. <laughs> and we do always kind of like, tend to march together, don't we, on things, uh, Mike, which is, there's something really beautiful about that. And yeah, thanks, Kate, for um, for reminding us of, of how it all really started. Yeah, I was rekindled, yeah. Rekindled, yeah. And uh, I mean, there are people right now who, who want to invisibilize LGSM. Mm. Um, yeah, I see it happening, it's all around, and we, we have to be really wary of about that people for whom it's an inconvenient truth that uh that the lesbian and gay movements and i've, I've used that advisedly because that, that's what it was nearly 40 years ago it was lgbtqi uh it was a, a a modern phenomena um there's a lot of people who don't like the idea that there's a class consciousness within the lgbt community um and and nor would they um but they, they do have great difficulty in trying to make us invisible because having a global movie made about you gives you some cachet, really. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I mean, I could swear, but I'll, I'll not. <laughs> it is, I mean, it, 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 it's only like something you to them. <laughs> it is, I, I, you know, it is remarkable. I, I, you know, I go to the, I'm a queer person, I go to the RBT on like on a Monday night or whatever, which I to go watch a drag show. And you still, you see, you know, people like younger than me in the audience who are wearing LGSM t-shirts and Pits and Perverts t-shirts. And it's like, it definitely, you know, it's it, it, like, it's definitely reaching out like to those communities still, definitely. Um, I, I wondered actually, Gary, off the back of all that conversation, you talked earlier on about how um, uh, often like your work has kind of brought people into contact um you know with uh with dance um and with that particular art form but it's the inverse true Do you, have you actually kind of been able to reach people who perhaps you know thought oh you know wh i know all about the minor strike it was that pesky arthur scargle and have you managed to kind of reach out to them and tell them the truth you know of 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 of, of the story Big style. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a, it's been really. That's where I, that's where I feel like I'm doing the most work is when I really change people's perceptions or understanding of what happened. And I think just to go back to this this idea of truth, although the work that I want to communicate is about political truth, it's also about the emotional impact and truth, and about really trying to tell those deep rooted stories about. Uh, you know, pride and heartache and the trauma and the fight and the loss and the relationships and the kind of the, the, the heart and the blood behind it all. That's definitely something that comes through the work that we've been delivering. So people then carry an empathy for the impact it had on people, not just through the political truth, but actually what the truth of what happened to these decimated communities. Um, and a lot of people comment on the media, like you've done, like you said, Sam. A lot of people say, "Oh, you know, we just saw it through a television screen, or just what you read in the newspapers." But actually, coming to see, you know, something like Call Our Way, Sam, which is um, from the eyes of of the working class, it's almost kind of reversed the messages. Suddenly, they're seeing it through a different lens, and they're they're carrying a, a deeper understanding and a bit and more empathy um, for the people that were victim of it all and still are, 
um, and still fighting for it. So it does, it changes their narrative and it changes their understanding. And I, I really enjoy when I see people shift their perception um, of what we perceive to be the truth. Um, it, it does it does happen a lot, but then vice versa as well. You get, you know, coal miners, you know, coming with their families who are equally um, taking something from it, whether it be political or emotional. Um, and then you get this amazing meeting of, of of two worlds sometimes, which is, you know, when we talk about new audiences, that's really exciting when you've got an audience full of eight, eight, nine hundred people and you know that there's a huge mix of opinions in the room. It's not just one community. Yeah. Um, you know, people from different generations as well. We have young kids now learning about their 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 history through contemporary dance. I remember this one history teacher um, saying that he'd been trying to teach these kids about the minor strike for so long and they just, for whatever reason, they weren't connecting with it and he brought them to see coal and suddenly right in front of them, there were these dancers telling this story and then they started to ask, who's the woman in blue? <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he just said so thank you for that you know that actually <laughs> our art form became a, a, a you know a moment where kids started to engage with local history through a different medium mm. I think and again the power of art and the the medium of art can be really useful for education as well as communication I guess too also that sort of um that emotional truth. Some, I mean, some of the things, and I think it'd be good to talk a little bit about on the lessons that we can draw from some of these in terms of the struggles we're going through now. You know, sometimes you get so angry at the world and you're, you know, and you feel that rage and you feel that, and then but everything around you is, uh, you, you know, it's as if like you're living in a parallel world and, uh, you know, and like, you just think, how can you say that you're in, like, you're crazy? Like, and then you think, am I crazy? And just having those sort of like artistic works that actually speak to that like emotional thing that you're going to be like, actually, this is the thing that we share in our community. It's a really galvanizing thing to actually like cause you to do something about it as well, I guess. It shows that you're not, uh, or maybe it's just me. It shows that you're not alone. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah, sorry to just jump in, but I, I just wrote a few notes about, you know, when um, when Kate was talking about that great relationship you've made with, you know, LGSM. And, and I think also art, and art practitioners and what we do in arts can be a really good opportunity for people to be to, to meet, the, you know, the strength in numbers, you know, that to, to align with, um, to stand by with, to hold hands with, um, not just politically, but artistically. And I think that's... Yeah. Again, that's something that I've really enjoyed about my journey through making this kind of work is I've I've managed to partner with so many amazing other arts organisations who are also plugged into the same um, kind of political bloodline as I am. So that feels really exciting. 100%. Um, we've been talking about the strike and artistic depictions of the strike and uh, an all grieve. Um, but I wonder too, how has that sort of sense of creativity and Chris, you talked about this earlier on about a little bit how we needed to touch on the images perhaps that use the all grieve campaign, campaigns campaigning. How has this kind of idea of creativity and using kind of creative means to campaign kind of carried through in the work of LGSM, in the work of the all grieve campaign? Obviously, Gary, your, <laughs> your, <laughs> your whole work is a, uh, a kind of creative output in that respect so what lessons do you think we can draw from the cultural creative of the minor strike for our yeah i mean i think i think with any kind of any, any kind of, of you know i don't want to use a capitalist term such as product but you know when when you are trying to um tell your truth um then like anything you know the better you package and you know, are able to uh, to catch people's eyes, then um, the more you can start a conversation. So, um, you know, we've always tried in the All Grief campaign, you know, we don't just like, you know, bang words down and get it out. We actually work with quite a lot of creative um, graphic designers and bounce a lot of ideas around before we actually, you know, have anything that goes to print. And I suppose one of the, one of the, you know, one of the main images of our campaign is the uh, reworking of the Coal Dot Doll uh, sticker that was used during the strike. Um, and it does raise a lot of questions and I'll, I'll come to the questions in a bit or Kate might, may want to, but you know, the Coal Dot Doll slogan 
um, was was you know that 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 it picked, you know encapsulated the strike. Um, we've taken that, but on the yellow sticker because it was black writing on a yellow sticker, we've added um, red images, uh, which is blood. It represents blood, and this is because of the miners who would go out picketing, uh, you know, for a peaceful day of picketing, uh, wearing their coal not doll stickers. All too often, they found that they were coming home with them with their blood on from where they had been attacked and beaten uh, at the hands um, of the police, um, state-directed police. Um, and so that was the story behind that with then our campaign writing around the Circle or Grief, Truth and Justice campaign. Um, and yes, it, it's looking backwards, but it's actually the inclusion of the blood on it. It's trying to make the very direct point uh, and also start a conversation uh, we've had some questions about it, haven't we, Kate? <laughs> we have, yeah. Why are you using... I mean, we've, we've had some aggression about it, understandably, given we're in a climate catastrophe at the moment. Um, but the meaning of the coal not dull sticker was basically saying, you know, jobs not benefits or jobs and industry not benefits. You know, people need to work. They don't want to be on the dole. So the whole mm. thing about coal... Uh, and the importance of coal at that time. And let's let's just be very clear, that strike was not about um, anything other than the Tories trying to destroy an industry because they wanted to destroy the trade union movement. Coal, after that strike, was imported massively from other countries into Britain and is still being imported into Britain. So coal is still used massively in this country. Um, but the coal not dole sticker, there was another one that we used a lot during the strike, which said um, dig deep for the miners. That was black on yellow with the National Union of Mine Workers around the edge. And another one um, sort of later and in the 1992 um, round of pit closures was um, the dispute goes on. So it was it's the logo of of the, um, you know, of the strike. And we felt it was really important to continue to use that logo as Chris describes. But we've explained that to people and we've talked about issues around tr just transition and all, and all the issues around climate. But that's not what our campaign's about. Our campaign is about social justice. And in order to get that discussion going, we need this visual sort of imagery to highlight our campaign and, and what we're uh, what we're talking about, really. Yeah. I'll um, mention another one as well, and it just happens to be promoting our um, forthcoming march and rally. But uh, certainly in South Yorkshire, I'm not sure if it's a national thing, but these blue and white notices uh, are what the police put up when they're appealing for witnesses to come forward. <laughs> Uh, and it does say on them most of the time a serious crime happened here or a serious incident happened here. So we've stolen that yeah. and we've claimed it um, to say that a serious crime happened at Orgrove. And I think, you know, it's got our, it's got other images on there. Um, but, you know, that in a way is is kind of like looking at, you know, how you how you can take a message um, and use it to your own, your own, you know, create your own um, own um, story out of it. Um, and we do use a lot of the artwork that was used, um, photographs taken at the time. Um, and you know, we, you know, we're very much uh, aware of the impact that they can have. Um, the one thing that we did feel was missing, though, was a, a women's uh, logo. And, you know, we, we, we all know, we all know the role that women play during the strike uh, and continue to do uh, fighting for justice. But we had a song, uh, which I think uh, got mentioned uh, by, by, you know, was it Gary, you mentioned the song, we've got to have the song in, we are women, we are strong. Um, but uh, we worked, predominantly Kate uh, worked with a graphic designer to, to do our women's logo. Um, which, you know, again, we, we use that in conjunction with all the other stuff as well. So we, we still kind of, you know, as I say, it's not just having a badge, it's not just having a logo. We've got quite a lot of thought, thought into it. 
but it expands it goes on forever because it's on badges it's on t-shirts it's on leaflets so we've got we've got a, a leaflet here and we've got a Darren Caulfield image that he sort of produces a piece of art that was from an original um, photograph during the strike. Uh, that's known as Clockwork or Grieve, and that's on our information leaflet. Um, but we use all this imagery and we do repeat it, repeat it, repeat it so that people know who we are. In fact, you know, you, you go on a demo now and if you don't see an Orgreave banner, you, you wonder why, you know, because um, we're uh, our uh, artwork and, and us, we're everywhere, you know, and it's important to have that constant imagery so that people do recognise us and get the message. Absolutely. Um, I wonder, we've got a few minutes left. I wonder, um, just as a finishing question, what do you think, uh, and this goes out to all of you, I guess, what do you think is the best way uh, now, and it kind of segues from our discussion before, um, of kind of uh, keeping issues like Orgreave uh, in the spotlight, keeping issues um, like the minor strike in the, in the spotlight, and arguing for like the continued relevance of those class struggle politics and keeping that kind of flame alive, um, uh, it, you know, in the situation we face today. What are the lessons that we can learn? Well, can I can I jump in straight away on that one? Do you remember when uh, Mick Lynch was interviewed early on in the strikes by Kate Burley, and she was going on about picket lines and. I mean, he handled it very well. Just said, "What do you mean picket line? See those seven blocks over there." <laughs> <laughs> and she was trying to wind him up and he was having none of it. However, I rushed off down to that very same picket that he was on the next day and said, mate, you missed a trick there. All you have to say is, well, I'm so interested that you're interested in picket lines because that's why my union supports the All Grieve Truth and Justice Committee. <laughs> having a public inquiry into policing of, of industrial disputes rest the case or agree truth and justice is really important right now to keep banging home because we need to to especially to younger trade unions who are on strike and in dispute right now and active with it they need to be reminded historically about what happened what the british state is capable of how unjust it is so that they themselves can fight back with that knowledge and fight back with the media as, as as well because they'll deny it all the time and we just need to keep banging away until it hurts them <laughs> but also i think um we're doing that quite successfully with with not just the um political engagement that we're doing like the marches and rallies and the meetings but the uh, the fun that we're having as well, you know, and um, uh, you know, we we organised quite recently in the autumn actually to commemorate and celebrate our tenth anniversary of the campaign. We organised a big event at the Leadmill in Sheffield. It was a night of music and comedy, and uh, so we produced artwork to um, to advertise the event itself and had loads of uh, artists, uh, performers there, comedians. And it was a really great night. And uh, and Chris and I were discussing this earlier and said, you know, we probably had more influence politically that evening mm. than we would marching through Sheffield, you know. So, uh, but, you know, we, we do honestly think that some of the great events that we've been organising over the last 10 years and that were organised during the strike and will be organised for the 40th anniversary will have much more of a political impact or indeed a great or even parallel political impact as, as you know serious serious events so uh, just keep on uh, on organizing wonderful events and wonderful events like this to talk about it yeah um gary chris did you want to come in just to finish finish off i think for me it's 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 about understanding that what happened in 1984 changed the future of this country like hugely and i think for me it's it's important history that we've got to keep being reminded about and not forget about it because it's all you know some of the narrative is always about the future because like i said before people want to forget the past but only by understanding the past can we get to the future and i think 
for me, it is about the next generation as well. It's about, you know, like Mike was saying, you know, some of the younger people also being in the know about what happened and how much the country has changed in the last 40 years and why. And mm -hmm. I think it's always about, it's about that. It's about, you know, really looking back at history and bringing it into the, into the future lens. And I think that's really, really important. It should act as a lesson for people. Definitely. And it, and it is, as Mike says, unfinished business as well. So, you know, we, we have got we've got so much to learn at just how ruthless a capitalist state will be uh, on people who create the wealth, um, which others live off, um, how ruthless they will be. You know, you you could end up with blood on your stickers like the miners did. You know, this is really, really important. Uh, but it is unfinished business. And, you know, we have got to get the truth to be accepted as the proper truth so that history has been written correctly by the people who experienced it and not this false story that is still hanging out there that was created by the government of the day, advanced by the media of the day, and it needs to be put right. Um, shortly after we got turned down for an inquiry, a whole load of police papers with, with papers about the policing of the strike were embargoed um, until until 2066. So on the one hand, no, you're not having an inquiry. We found the existence of police documents that hadn't seen the light of day. And then we found out, oh, no, we've embargoed them. Now, that tells you, you know, what the battle we have. And so every tool that we have, um, including our wonderful art and banners, the work that Gary does, um, you know, theatre uh, and music, and especially music. <laughs> I mean, music, because the way we talk about music is the way we talk about socialism. You know, we talk about having better harmony. We talk about, you know, when we have discords. These are musical terms, you know. All of that is what we uh, have as part of the struggle um, to achieve, you know, what is a very, very important uh, and correct writing of our history. Listen, thanks so much, the four of you, for joining me uh, today. It's been a really, really fantastic conversation. And thanks, everyone who's been watching, uh, uh, watching along on YouTube. Um, just a couple of things, please. Again, if you've enjoyed the discussion, uh, donate to Rise Festival. That's how we put these events on. Uh, as I said, there'll be a donation uh, post donation link posted in the video chat um, on YouTube. Also, um, get involved in things too. So uh, we've talked about uh, the rally and the march um, to commemorate uh, what happened at Orgreave on the 17th of June. Get along to that. Um, you know, get along to Wasteland. Um, go, go and see uh, Gary's work. Um, what put on this film screening of Pride um, in your in your community in your kind of activist group? Um, and please do uh, follow the social media of everyone on the call as well. And hopefully, I'll see you at the other events at Arise Festival this year. And thanks again for joining. Uh, see everyone later. Bye.